time we've had the Roy Reed lecture series without Roy. We lost him toward the end of the year. About three years ago, um, Roy got some of his friends uh, together and told us that they were going to have a kind of a sneak preview of the movie Selma at the Razorback Theater here in Fayetteville. Anybody here see the movie Selma? Uh, some of you may know or may not know that the movie was really taken from Roy's stories of what happened, um, all the things that went down with Dr. King and um, John Lewis and others there leading up to that violent walk across the bridge. Um, and it was a great movie. But after the movie, uh, a few of us went to dinner with Norma and Roy, uh, and, and Roy sort of waxed about what really went down uh, uh, during that time period. Because in the movie um, that was taken from his stories, there is a young reporter who portrays the reporter Roy Reed of the New York Times. Now, we joked with Roy that as handsome as that actor was, not nearly as handsome as the young Roy Reed that <laughs> covered the events at Selma. Uh, and what Roy told us that evening, and it was a special evening, is that uh, they largely got it right. Um, that there was one thing that he said they didn't get right, that Roy didn't phone in his story from a, a, a pay telephone right by the bridge, that he actually had enough time, and we didn't have social media in those days, the deadlines were a little different, he actually had enough time to go back to the motel to call in his story the day of the actual march. And you know about um, a little over an hour ago, the bells here at the alumni house rang 39 times for those 39 years that Dr. King lived. A short life, but an incredibly impactful life. I really don't know that it's much of a stretch to think that without Dr. King and his dream and all that he, uh, and he wasn't really a fighter. I mean, all those things, you know, I am a man that we think this down. Why were they fighting for that in Memphis? Uh, all of the demonstrations were peaceful. But without Dr. King and what he did at Selma and at Montgomery and all over the South, and without reporters like Roy Reed, who uh, gave what happened a real voice, I don't know that we are here celebrating the life of an African-American news reporter who grew up in West Memphis, Arkansas. I don't know if those opportunities would have even I have had the great pleasure of not only knowing but being friends with T.J. Holmes since his very first journalism class, Media and Society. Now that was an odd semester. By faith, I taught that big class that Hoyt Purvis taught for, how many years did you teach that class, Hoyt? Like 85 years, I think. <laughs> and it was a big cattle call class. Kara teaches it, Kara Gould teaches it now. But the one time that I taught it, when Hoyt was on sabbatical, um, a young Lucilius Holmes was in that class. And his grades were okay. But one time he turned in a paper, and it was really a good paper. And I don't really remember the subject, but I remember that it was insightful and well-written. I don't know if he remembers this or not. But I wrote on there, few notes, and I made sure that I handed it directly to him, because I'm not sure that I had actually met him then, uh, before that time. And I handed him the paperback, knowing what his other grades were, and I looked at him and I said, you know, Lutilius, you could make all A's if you wanted to. And he looked at me with his wry grin and said, yeah, I've been told that one before. <laughs> uh, Advance a few years to TV reporting, and we went around the room one day, and um, we were asking people what they wanted to do. And one young woman wanted to be a reporter, and this person wanted to do that. And I remember one girl said that, I really don't want to have a career. I just want to get married and have babies. <laughs> she got married and had one baby. <laughs> um, we got to TJ, and he said, I want to make a lot of money. <laughs> so I hope you have done OK. <laughs> <laughs> A few years ago, I was uh, fortunate, uh, very fortunate, to be inducted into the Lemke Hall of Honor. And uh, Kevin Trainer, one of my former students, had been, uh, probably Susan probably told him that he should introduce me. Um, and uh, they wanted a, a 
a name or two of some students that I've had that might say nice things about me. So I said, well, get in touch with TJ. So while uh, Kevin is introducing me uh, that evening, uh, TJ's comments went something like this. Yeah, I guess he was probably my favorite teacher. He was my go-to guy. But honestly, I can't remember a single thing that he ever actually taught me. <laughs> but he did have a question. Is he still driving around in that red Mustang convertible with a UATV license plate on the front? No is the answer to that. Uh, when, TJ, when we knew that TJ was going to come and be the Johnson Fellow, it was very exciting. A very exciting time for us to have him back. And he comes back a lot. He's a very loyal alum. Uh, one of the things he asked was that instead of a speech, he'd like for a student to introduce him and also uh, interview him. So at this time, I'll have TJ and Clarissa Bustamante come on up and take your chairs. And I'll tell you a little bit about Clarissa. Clarissa Bustamante, and I just love to say the name Bustamante. It's really great. Don't ever let them change your name, Clarissa, when you get on television. Um, Clarissa is a senior broadcast journalism major from Arlington, Texas. She has been involved in UATV, I think, since the second that she hit campus. Uh, for the last number of years, she's been on the senior management team at UATV. She is the host and producer of one of our long running shows, Razorback Reels and it's the best it's ever been under her direction. She wants to be an entertainment reporter, so here you go. Clarissa, <laughs> you're on. Well, that's not nerve-wracking at all. <laughs> what, should it's it's just the aesthetics, is what you're saying? No. For that one? Oh, for that, okay. Well, man, so yeah. both. We need both. Yes, ma'am. <laughs> All right, well, thank you, Professor Foley, for that introduction. TJ Holmes, I'm so excited that you're here. Man, he, so this is the guy guiding young journalism lives one. here <laughs> about truth and telling the truth. And he got up here and lied so much to y'all just saying about my background. <laughs> just lies. Um, but yeah, Foley was, he was. He was my guy. He was my go-to guy. Some of that was true. Some of it he absolutely elaborated or exaggerated on, for sure. But Well, the truth is that your real name is Lutilius. Oh, yes. Correct? So he's telling you not to change your name. And that was my first three pieces in my professional career. I signed off on the first one as Lutilius Holmes. Second one, I signed off as Lou Holmes. And okay. the third one, I signed off as TJ Holmes. Now, the TJ, for you guys, um, I'm named after my dad, who's Lutilius home senior now, but he was named after a great uncle uh, that we had. Before that, not sure where the name came from, but as a nickname, he, he was growing up, they called him Little T, just T as a nickname. So I came along as Lutilius Holmes Jr. Everybody in my family calls me T Jr. Uh, and I was looking for something to go with on TV. And so TJ is made up. My family doesn't call me TJ, it's T Jr. <laughs> but it's my favorite thing to do when I go visit young students, I say, I'll give anybody here like a free trip to Hawaii if you figure out what the T and the J stand for. And it stands for nothing. Um, <laughs> but that's the story, please. That's incredible. OK, so you made the trip all the way from New York to Fayetteville. Um, so how does it feel to be back on your old stopping grounds? Does it bring up any old memories? Um, yeah, of course it does. I mean, this, is, uh, this was everything to me. This is where I became an adult, essentially. This is home. This is the university that put me uh, on the track to be where I am now. So this university, this campus is everything to me. And I've come back and I usually come back, I've been with the Chancellor's Board of Advisors for several years and I usually get back on a football weekend. Mm -hmm. um, but I mean, I can't think, uh, if, if you all don't know, Jeff and uh, Marsha are here in the front row here. You all, the Johnson, these are the Johnson Fellows, right? Who put together the Johnson Fellowship. But thank you guys so much for this opportunity to come back. I always say it means everything when your university invites you back. It's essentially you all claiming me that they think I've done good to the point that they don't mind telling people that I belong to you guys. So I usually don't get a chance to come back and be recognized in this way. I'm just here to kind of hang out and advise a little bit. But really, guys, I can't thank you all enough for, for having me back and the opportunity for me and Sabine and my whole family is up here on the front row. Um, so really appreciate it. Um, do you have a favorite memory here at the university, something uh, that just like sticks out to you? You know what? Um, a lot of people don't know this, but I was with the, um, 
I was with the basketball program in a capacity for a couple years here. Um, some people know Foley knows this. Was it like a walk-on? Yes, because you all, some, some will pretend how old you are will know this, the names Jesse Pate and Sunday Adebayo, right? And after the university won, we won the national championship in 94, finished runner-up in 95. I got to campus the fall in 95. And Jesse and, um, and Sunday were two uh, junior college transfers. And some questions came up about their junior college transfer eligibility. And so they had to sit. Mm -hmm. And so Jesse was the leading scorer, Sunday was the leading rebounder. And they had to sit while the NCAA was investigating. NCAA went on with the investigation so long. Again, some people, again, some of you remember this, but they transferred from the university. So Nolan was down two scholarship athletes. And because of the recruiting timing, the next year he was down two major spots. So he didn't have enough players to practice competitively and practice at some points because of that. The next year he had open tryouts for two scholarship positions on the basketball team. Every guy who ever touched a basketball <laughs> showed up at Bud Walton Arena for tryouts. I was one of those guys. Now he ends up going with these two studs, the one six, seven, six, eight guy, fine. But I got a call and Nolan decided to keep an extra seven walk-ons in the program that he would have just kind of a crop of guys to, in case something happened, some other injury, some other investigation, whatever. And we had essentially a JV team that we had to go play NAIA schools, division two schools, junior colleges. I was a part of that team and his son, who was an assistant, was my head coach on that team. So you talk about memories. I know I got folks here, uh, Aaron and, Rob, and, uh, and, and Robin, these two that were, I was in um, college with them uh, in the journalism program. And they know I was in Foley knows, and a lot of people know that story, but I was, I was a ball player here for a little <laughs> while. Never got in a game with the main squad ever, but we had to practice with them and also we had our own practice and our own schedule. So that was a memory from the University of Arkansas that, y'all, I could ball, man. Do I you was, miss those days? Do you ever wish I you could was, go back on the court? I wish, yes, I, but now it's not even a matter of age. A, a good friend of mine, Tony Harris, was an anchor at CNN. Uh, we were there together and I would go play pickup ball and he would always tell me, don't. Man, you get hit in the face. <laughs> These guys have jobs. You have a career. <laughs> like he would always you tell me. Right? He said, "You gotta protect your face, man." He said, "Either go play in a mask, put on a a, a mouthpiece." But that he discouraged me from playing ball. I haven't played competitively or pick up like that in a long right, time. Right, you've got an important job now. You're working for it's, Good Morning America. It's just correct? a job. It's just a so you job. have a regular job. I have, I have a regular have. job. Right. Yes. Um, a Good Morning America is with ABC, but of course you didn't start there. So no. tell me a little bit about the first couple of jobs that you had coming right out of college. I drove 66 miles from here to Joplin, Missouri, delivered my resume tape to KSN TV, and I was hired on the spot as a producer. Um, but I would go in, I worked seven days a week because I would work on the weekends just so I could report. I did it for about two months, then I got a reporter gig when it opened up, and then it became the weekend anchor. I was only in Joplin about nine or ten months. Moved to Little Rock, was a weekend anchor for three years, then moved to the NBC O&O in San Francisco, then moved to CNN, then left CNN and did a gig with BET for a year. Went to MSNBC for about a year and a half, and then I some kind of way ended up at Good Morning America. And so you bounced around you bounce to around. a lot of different stations, yeah. and so you've told a lot of different stories, I'm sure. Yeah. Do you have a favorite one? Uh, I have some favorite, have some favorite trips. I have some favorite. One of my favorite stories was one I did recently, which had an impact with Johnny Menzel. It was an important story. It had to do with mental health, but Johnny Menzel is a big story and it got a lot of play. But also, it had this. I mean, a guy who's trying to get his life together, who has been uh, in the fourth. I mean, has been. I mean. How much have we heard about Johnny Manziel over the past you know, five, seven years, just his journey and him admitting that he uh, is bipolar now and taking mm -hmm. medication for being bipolar. And that was, it sparked a conversation, not just about him, but about mental illness and about men. Um, but that interview was a big deal because, I mean, he opened up in a way to me that I would say 
some of that had to do with me being from Arkansas, him being from Texas, and that we spent time together on campus. First time I'd ever met him. But we just walked around and we're just hanging out as two guys and he just got comfortable. So when the camera started rolling, he opened up in a way that he might not have opened up to other folks. That's stuff you're proud of, not that just, Absolutely. wow, I asked him a really tough question. Now, no, part of the job sometimes is just making someone feel good, feel comfortable, feel like they're in a good place with you. Then it allows them and makes them want to open up. And that was just one recent here that I like. But there's been a lot of human interest stories. There have been a lot of reunion stories. There have been a lot of more so when you get a chance to honor people for the work they do uh, and to recognize folks. And more so the feel good stories are the ones you walk away really proud of. So how do you get someone to open up to you like that? You know, do you just do you prefer to take them on walks instead of you know just sitting down across the table or how do you get them to tell you the story and get emotional you know it's it's what has worked for me and I get yeah, I do think it has something to do with me being from Arkansas I'm raised in a place where and again the, just the nature of who we are here in the south we're just southern good, gentlemen right that we're just down home folks we're just we we are different we welcome people we're warm in a different way and so often people will when you have a tough interview, certainly. If I'd have sat down with Johnny and had a list of notes and cards and reading questions one by one, he would have felt like he was being interrogated or interviewed versus felt, feeling like he was having a conversation with someone. And that has been the thing that has worked for me over the years is that I, I don't go into an interview with notes or with, an, you know, I prepare, but I don't sit down and read question, question, question. That's how you miss things a lot of times. Right. He said, because I didn't ask him a question about his mental health. I asked him whatever question and he just started talking and talking. And all of a sudden he was, he said, yeah, I'm taking medication for bipolar and blah, 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 and da, 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 da. And I sat up and said, wait a minute, wait. I say, I say, what now? You're taking medication? So you miss things when you're actually not listening. You're having a conversation and it shouldn't be an interview. Mm -hmm. And that's what has kind of paid off and worked for me over the years and it certainly worked in that interview with him. And I know that Professor Foley um, says that a lot about you, or mm -hmm. talks about how important that is, is that you don't script things and you, know, you mm -hmm. tell the producers to turn off the teleprompter and you All just... Right. <laughs> You just go for it and you just tell the story. I mean, what advice do you have for young journalists to you know, t step away from the script and you know, do things just based on their research? You know, it's just, it really is a matter of just knowing what you're talking about. If you, any story, I, um, I trained myself, I didn't get to talk to you all about this in the class early, but it's another method I use is that very early on, every, and again, if it's, who are there, are there broadcast students in here? Where are they? A few here and say, woo. Um, <laughs> um, every story you do, right? You toss to a package, you toss to a piece. Mm -hmm. I always said early on, because when you're in a smaller market, there's more of a chance of this happening. If your piece doesn't roll, <laughs> if that piece doesn't roll or something, the wrong piece airs, if it goes down, you should be able to stand there in front of that camera and tell that story, no problem, without needing a script, without needing guide, you, nothing. You should be able to just tell that story. If you know what you're talking about, you're going to be fine. And that's, I prepare for a story or interview with the Speaker of the House, with Johnny Menzel, or a story about who Taylor Swift just broke up with this week. <laughs> exactly the same. You know everything you can know about it, and you sit there and you're confident uh, about what you're talking about. So that's the thing that works for me. I just, I hate being scripted. I hate, I hate reading. <laughs> on television. I do, I hate reading on television is the thing. So do you think that's what helped you break out of those smaller markets like Joplin and Little Rock? Or how do you think you were able to get from there to San Francisco and New York and you know, big markets like that? I mean, you get, you get some breaks, you get a little lucky, you get blessed, you get, hopefully somebody thinks you're good, but you yeah. just, you have a good system or a good support system around you got a good team you got good reps you got something i mean you just you stay at it and you work at it and it's going to hopefully work out that's what i say to every journalism student look whatever it is if you decide that's what you want to do stick with it and it's going to work out maybe not exactly how you thought maybe not the timing but it's going to work out if you decide that's what you want to do and again i've just been lucky along every step and now i'm every every misstep Every mistake, every downtime, every time I was turned down for an interview, every time I was turned down for a job, it was the worst thing at the moment. 
but it got me sitting here in front of you guys at this point. So everything clearly worked out. I think it at least worked out. So I just, I encourage all, everybody just it, it stick. If that's what you want to do, stick with it. And it is going to work out, even though it's not going to be exactly how you thought it would. What's the most notable mistake that you can think of that kind of helped you propel your career to what it is now? Uh, da, 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 da. You know what? Uh, working with BET was a huge misstep on my Why? part. Um, I learned a lot about the business uh, in terms of contracts, in terms of handshakes, in terms of um, making sure you get exactly what you want and the language you want in a contract. I learned a lot about that. I learned not to trust people um, in that. Did someone, <laughs> that what happened? What caused you not to trust people? Well, in that uh, situation, a lot of people, if you don't know, I went from CNN and I did a show that was supposed to be geared toward the black community um, on BET, a, a nightly show. And it meant a lot to me to do so. I didn't have to leave CNN. I made that call to do so because it meant something to me. It really was important to me to have a show like that on the air. Um, but I found, look, we went through four, five, six months of talks and negotiations and to, for me to get comfortable uh, with what was going on. And there was a lot of assurances and guarantees and promises and we're all on the same page. And yes, TJ, that's the show we want to do too, the show you want to do. And as soon as I get over there, they flip the script, they want something else. They want a different type of show. What they wanted was a daily show for black people. I'm not a comedian. There's no way if anybody would have said to me that's what they wanted, I just would have said, I'm not your guy. I'm not going to do that. Got there and that's what they wanted. Uh, they didn't want a more serious show. They wanted my personality, but they didn't want the type of topics I wanted to tackle. So it was a battle every single day over there. And it was just awful. I actually learned afterwards that people in a lot of meetings that I had with BET, they were instructed not to use the words funny or comedy in the meetings. So it's a way to trick you into thinking that you were able it, to tell the stories that you wanted to tell. It was a coup for them to get me on board, right? I had a better reputation nationally, if you will, than BET did when I joined them. Absolutely. Right? So it was a big deal to, all right, we got this guy from CNN is coming over here. So it must, right? It gave them kind of a boost where people were like, wow, maybe BET is about to Making you know, them look get it good together instead of making you look it good. It was it was awful. It was a horrific experience and but I learned a lot. And that still that horrific experience got me to where I am now. It put me all it was all a part of my journey. So you wish you would have maybe stayed with CNN and then gone nope. from there to Good Morning America nope. or Nope. I probably never maybe never would have got the Good Morning America gig. Right? It was all a part of the process. It's all a part of the journey. My, my mom has been telling me this. She used to tell me this um, right when I was going through the process of interviewing and whatnot. Like, go pop a bottle of champagne and celebrate just that you got the interview because you still got a lot farther than a lot of other people did, even if you don't get the job. I learned this along the way that even you only, it's only a failure if you fail to learn the lesson of what you went through. Right. It does not matter that it didn't work out the way you think it should have. I learned a lot from that and it's so valuable in every contract and business and everything I've done afterwards. It had, and again, it, it put me on the path. It got me to New York full time. It made me move to New York full time where I had to be there to be with MSNBC that then opened up the opportunity to ABC. It all worked out. All right, day. it all worked out, but it was kind of a negative experience for you. Mm -hmm. Uh, so which station would you say that you've had the most positive experience with? Um, probably um, CNN because, uh, yeah, wait, um, <laughs> one second. <laughs> They've been different. They've been different. Um, <laughs> uh, no, my sister's up here talking. She's been through me, with me through all these uh, stations and she hears all the stories. Um, but it, they're all just different. And you balance out where you live, where you get to work, who you get to work with, the opportunities you get, the airtime you get, the type of stories you get to do, the money that you make, what it allows for your life. And you balance all that out. And really, guys, they're all just kind of a crappy lifestyle when you're really going that. No, it's just you deal with stuff at every place. You got to deal with a little junk. You got to deal with this 
right? I got this, I got a great schedule, but my boss sucks. All right. Now I got a great boss, but man, I got to get up at four in the morning. I mean, you just, you kind of balance out. So, so I, how do you deal with something like that? You know, what motivates you to keep doing it? You know, even if you have a bad schedule or a bad boss or something like that. I mean, come on, that's some good perks, sister. Come on now. <laughs> some good perks to the gig. Don't get me wrong. Um, What's your favorite perk? Um, <laughs> All of them. <laughs> no, look. Look, okay. Look, we, can we be honest here for a second? <laughs> No, oh my. <laughs> my sister's like, please don't be honest tonight. Um, <laughs> look, um, I got to go to Rio to cover the Olympics in yes. 2016. I got to go to London for a week and never got on the air, but I got to kick it for a week in London on ABC's Dime. I got to go to Athens for a month to cover the Olympics back in 2004. I got to go to South Africa to cover the, uh, the rhino poaching situation there. Um, I've been to the last three World Series, last three NBA Finals, the last two Super Bowls, the last two Final Fours. I have gotten to do some cool stuff. And look, the job pays okay. I mean, <laughs> Look. It didn't start paying okay though, right? In Joplin? No, I, mean, I was talking to you guys about this earlier. True story, my first job out of here, Joplin, Missouri, contract 17000 a year. It's my first job out of school. And I was telling them earlier that I called the station, uh, I mean, not too many years ago, because I wanted a copy of my contract. I couldn't find it. And I hold on to that thing, I keep it in a safe place. Because anytime I'm having a bad day, I pull that thing out. <laughs> and I read through it down to the line, it says 17, 000. <laughs> and then I go over and find a bottle of wine and say, This ain't bad. <laughs> uh, so, no, it's just. Look, there are some perks. Look, I, I get up in the morning, a guy is there to pick me up in a black car and drop me off at a studio where there are photographers outside taking your picture. I walk in and I work with Michael Strahan, Robin Roberts, and George Stephanopoulos. Every single day, some huge star is walking through our hallways. Um, you just get, I can't believe, every day, these are friends of mine, I still have to pinch myself that I get to walk into a studio every day and work with these people. It's just, some of it's just cool and it's fun and you can't believe it. Um, so yeah, the perks of it, I mean, that, that stuff's cool. Well, so what advice cool. do you give to young journalists who have that you know, $17,000 contract and think, you know, journalism it, you know, doesn't pay well, I don't like where I am, what advice do you have to them to keep going and keep trying to strive for a better market? Oh no, stick it out if that's what you want to do. And it's not all about money. Again, the BET gig, I was willing, uh, that's not a good example, but let me finish the story. I was willing to take a pay cut to do that BET gig. It was not all about money. I say I shouldn't tell it because I did not have to take a pay cut, but I was willing to do so. I made that decision on a flight back from New York with my wife. We decided if the number's this, which is lower than what I was making at CNN, I'll take it. So it's not all about money. Uh, you can have a good living. You can have a good living as a reporter in Denver, as a reporter in Phoenix, as a reporter in Chicago. You can have a great living. It's not all about money. But it is, it's just a matter of stick with it and it'll work out for you. It will work out. Something else that I've talked to other young journalists about that might deter them from going into this is the relationship of the media with our president and the idea of fake news and, um, you know, just completely um, discrediting, you know, the work that, you know, journalists do, you know, we're trying to get the truth out there and then having it called fake news, has that affected your career or how does, um, how does that help affect you? No, Donald Trump is getting us all paid. I mean, let's just, bottom line, we beefed up our DC bureau. There are people who can directly thank Donald Trump for their jobs. That's bottom line. CNN is one that you, you use, uh, people use that example a lot, but they made a conscious decision to go after this guy in a certain way and the numbers pay off, right? So you can't, 
we can argue all day we want. And you're right, he has that, that, that mega microphone and that bully pulpit, and he can stand up there and say fake news. Fake. And we have to cover the guy who's calling us fake news, right? right. <laughs> he is a master, master manipulator of media. And it, it, it's, it's brilliant. What he is able to do with the media is brilliant. And if it hurts us, what it does is it leaves us very little room for mistakes because every time one does happen, he can go, ah, I told you, I told you. Um, we've had a couple of incidents at ABC where something happened. We had a reporter actually, a reporter had a story that actually affected the stock market. His reporting affected the stock market, right? It lost hundreds of points that day because of our reporters um, reporting and he was wrong. President Trump went nuts on that. As, I mean, we laid that out for him, but a mistake was made. So that makes things a little more difficult. But him, just as far as being a story, does gangbusters for us um, and for the media. And a lot of people have jobs and ratings are up a lot of ways because people cover Donald Trump. And I know we talked about this in class a little bit too. You said you have a friend who made an active decision to you know, chase the hot story. <laughs> and you know talk about donald trump and things like that and uh, you don't completely agree with that no so I, why i we, well we're in an age now where folks you can write you you get one one hot youtube video you get one hot tweet you get one hot instagram post you have one hot story and somebody can become a household name and a lot of folks look megan kelly is a good example of this she was doing fine at Fox, don't get me wrong, but she became a household name because she got into it with Donald Trump. And a lot of people see him and his, uh, his willingness to engage, even on Twitter, as if I can get the president to talk about me, that's gonna be good for my career. That's a lot of what's happening with the social media age now, that you actually can become a star. You just need to, to light some fire to get somebody talking about you. I'm not built like that. Some people don't care what you say about them as long as you're talking about them. I'm just not built that way, but a lot of people are now trying to find something to just set people off. You know, we talk about Twitter trolls and things like this. A lot of folks in the media industry are just looking to they need a moment and sometimes taking on the president in ways that I'm not comfortable with are um, the things that get them known. So you choose not to chase those, you know, hop on issues <laughs> just to get that one, you know, minute of fame or, you know, try to blow up your career. So what kind of stories do you like to chase? You know, what stories are important to tell? Uh, I am very much, again, as a scene in uh, education, politics was big for me. Uh, anything engaging the black community, certainly having to do with young black men. A lot of those stories, as you know, with the, you know, the relationship between the uh, police and the black community, those were things I'd love to do. And again, that was something of why I really liked the BET gig, or at least initially was attracted to it. Um, now at ABC, it's more so with Good Morning America, I get the opportunity to do these these feel where you get to honor someone, you get to recognize a member of a community and, and, and surprise them with some, I don't know, community event. You get to, it's more so, I, I'd like to, more human interest stories and I've gotten a chance to do a, um, a number of those that really you feel good when you walk off the set. There have been several really memorable ones for me at Good Morning America that that's more so the stuff I get to do now that I really appreciate. So going back to the stories about the black community and you know why you went on to BET to tell those kinds of stories, we have a question from the audience uh. um, talking about um, that. So the question was, what is it like being a male minority in a predominantly white industry? <laughs> Do you feel like you have to fight twice as hard to get half as far? Um, <laughs> my issue well, or to answer that question, is that I am in a business that's subjective anyway, right? I could be, my boss now could love me. As soon as my boss gets fired, the next guy coming in could hate me. But so often I am being judged, not so often, always, I am being judged by people sitting around a table that look nothing like me. Um, I've been in a number of, like we've seen these meetings from CNN to every single media organization I've worked for there's somebody sitting around a table making a fate about my career 
that doesn't look like me, doesn't understand me, doesn't come from where I come from. They, they don't, not that they don't like me, he's a nice guy or whatever else, but they're making this, the people that are essentially judging you don't look like you, can't relate to you. And Byron Pitts is somebody who told me this story. Yeah, well, not a story, but when you play pickup basketball, there's, right, you have two captains. And everybody's going to pick the guy from the office who used to play for Georgia Tech. And all right, I'm going to pick that guy. He's 6'8". I'm going to pick that guy there. He had a, two years in the NBA. I'm going to pick that guy over there who's, right? You pick the studs first. And then after that, everybody just starts picking who they're comfortable with. Uh, that's my friend I go to lunch with, and he'll play good defense. Okay, that, that's my boy there. He can make it from the baseline. He said, that's what it's like in the industry for us. And that I know a lot of you all have watched TV before and thought, how did they get that job? How do they keep getting jobs? What's happening is people are sitting around a table, and everybody's going to pick Katie Couric. Everybody's going to pick the studs. But after that, they start picking people that look like them, that they're comfortable with. And that ain't ever me. It's never, ever me in every job I've had. So that becomes a challenge. And we have diversity initiatives. And right, you don't want to be, nobody wants to be picked just to, 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 to meet a quota. And we got diversity on the air. But so much of it is behind the scenes. It doesn't matter if tomorrow you wake up and Good Morning America, every single anchor and reporter is black. I can guarantee you that every single producer, executive producer, and senior producer is white. You have my word at Good Morning America. They just promoted one young lady not too long ago, but as soon as they promoted her up, they created a new position <laughs> above her that she has to answer to. And my sister's back there laughing, she's like, ah. <laughs> yes, it happened, yes, I see you, sister. It's all right, a lot of people can relate. She, we fought to get this young lady a, a, a promotion to the level she should be at. And then they put some, created a brand new position that she has to now answer to. Um, that's the reality of what we deal with uh, oftentimes behind the scenes. And that is certainly a challenge that we're working on. So what advice do you have for people who are trying to fight that? I mean, how do you have that happening and still continue to rise up the ranks? Be in the room. Um, you have to be. There, there are folks who fought at CNN ahead of me. There are folks who... Um, um, certainly Byron Pitts has been a mentor of mine for a decade now. You have to be in the room and you have to understand that whatever I'm fighting, you have to understand you are not going to always be the beneficiary of your efforts. There's somebody in this room or somebody at this journalism program coming up behind me that's going to benefit from what I am doing at, the, at Good Morning America. And you, you have to understand somebody's coming behind you. It's not, it's my fight but I am not gonna be the beneficiary. So you have to keep that in mind. If you're in there fighting for you and I want this and I want that, it's not gonna work. We, um, again, a lot of people don't know this story, um, that we, we at Good Morning America, we at ABC, um, all of the African-American talent at, a, at, Good, at ABC got together and went in to the ABC president and demanded that we get African-American senior producers and executive producers. None of us are going to benefit from that effort. None of us. But we understood how it's important to have those folks in the room and contributing to the editorial content. When of did our, that happen? We've, this is about a year, a little over a year that initiative has been going on. And it's bared some fruit, but we have to understand it's for the folks that are coming up behind us. So uh, encourage folks, you just have to understand it's, it's not all about you. Somebody's coming up behind you, but if you're not willing to be in that fight, if you're not willing to raise your voice, if you're not willing to be in the room, and another part of it is it's very difficult to be the only one in the room, to raise your hand and say, hey, guys, y'all probably shouldn't be covering that story like that. That feels a little icky, right? You remember the ESPN uh, when they did the auction? For the, uh, you know, some of my brother, ESPN, they, they did a football, um, essentially were auctioning off players. <laughs> and the clip that aired was all white people <laughs> sitting in an audience like this, bidding on a black player. How long did it take y'all to figure out that that's probably not the right thing you should do? <laughs> Who was sitting, somebody was missing from that room to say, you know what, guys? Mm, it's not a good look. 
And that thing went on the air and ESPN had to issue an apology. Things like that get missed when you don't have diversity in the room. Now it's not just a race, but a diversity of, of regions, right? There's things that I will talk about and be interested in that somebody from New York will want or somebody from California or wherever it may be. So you just need diversity and we oftentimes have Northwestern elites and folks who has have, a, excuse me, Northeastern elites and just have a certain mindset and there's no diversity in the room. Diversity is something that Professor Foley and a lot of the professors here really focus on and want us to use in our stories. So how do you incorporate diversities, um, diversity in your stories that you're telling? Oh, well, again, you have to think about what uh, you have a audience. Who's the audience? Who's watching? It's not just people that look like me. It's not people that look like you. It's not just men. It's not just women. It's not just old. It's not just young. You have to try to consider. And oftentimes in my stories, I will walk around that studio in our building in Times Square and I will ask this 25 year old young white girl what she thinks about the story, the 40 year old black guy who's a father of two, Oscar who's our guy who handles all of our food, who has three sons. I will ask all of them like if you heard this would that be interesting? Which part is interesting to you? And I incorporate that, incorporate that oftentimes. I get more help from our staff in that way than I do from any producer. So I, that is kind of how I sometimes measure stories and what's interesting to people by actually talking to as diverse a group as I can. Yeah, absolutely. So, um, you know, you said you interview a wide variety of people to make sure that you get everyone's opinion. Mm -hmm. Is there one interviewer, one person that you've met that's just really changed, maybe not changed your life, but really had an impact on you? Somebody, somebody I've interviewed? Mm -hmm. Change? Ah, oh, man. Um, there were some folks I met. Um, this guy named Royce and his wife. Um, this was one of those stories I felt really good about. The, um, and it's a, it was one of the saddest and most encouraging story about people that I've done. Um, this, he and his wife um, were having a child. It was their second child. And they learned early on that the child had a condition with the brain that the child wasn't going to live beyond a matter of minutes, hours, or at most days, right? They learned this early and they had a chance to terminate the pregnancy, but they decided to carry the child full term, knowing the child would perish so they could actually donate the child's organs. I sit down with these, I go to Oklahoma City to do the story and I walk in and I'm just kind of down expecting them to be a certain way. And they were just this happy and upbeat and they were so comfortable in what they were doing and they were just their decision. These were folks who were Christians and they said there was no way, it, it wasn't a matter of you know, having that decision that we weren't going to terminate the pregnancy. They said we thought we were against abortion before. They said, but we considered it. And they said, people do not know what they'll do until you're faced with that decision. And they taught me just a lot about good, being a good human being and a lot about so much. I mean, can you imagine that argument that people would have had on Twitter about a story, about something like that? You don't know what you will do until you're put in that position. And I thought it was this, uh, just an incredible selfless act. They were the warmest people. And that was one story that, that got me, um, that really got me. So that, that's, that was last May, I think it was. So it was fairly recent. But that was one that certainly stands out in my career. I mean, that's incredible. Is there a way that you interview people when it's really emotional in a different way they interview children or the way they interview someone for a lighter story? I mean, how do you adapt to the people that you're talking to and the stories that you're covering. You just listen. I mean, you sit down. Everybody in here, if, if you went, if you all, all of you all went one-on-one -on -one out, right, talk to everybody here one-on-one, -on -one, you'd be able to tell what kind of mood folks are in, right? I look at my daughter right now, she's sleepy. I would talk to her a certain way, right? I look at my sister right now, she's drunk. I would talk to her a certain way. I look at my, like my man back there in the baseball cap. He's kind of chill. He's yawning, right? My man, he's, you can feel everybody out as you're looking at them. Some folks are ready to go to, will go clubbing. Some people need to get their Adderall. Some people are ready to go 
right? My brother, he's like, oh, he know me, right? No, he, <laughs> everybody, you can feel out how they are by looking at them and you know what you can get away with. There are days, even with George and Robin, I had to feel their moods out in the morning. Like, ooh, George ain't in the mood for this today. Ooh, Robin had wine last night. Ooh. You, it's, it's that simple. And it, whether with kids, some kids are more outgoing, whether it's an emotional story. Like I said, I was expecting one thing with that couple. I walk in and they cheer me up, right? You can ju you feel out. It's key to just be a human being and sometimes we forget to do that in this business. Absolutely. Oh, well, Professor Foley, as you saw, just handed me this oh, gift. This? Definitely not for me. Oh, wow. So I'm going to go ahead and give to you a little bit of backstory. Do I need um, to open this here? Open it right now. Right? Oh, wow. <laughs> hey, I don't have to answer to you anymore, Foley. Uh, Look, I got my C from your class. I'm good now. <laughs> <laughs> He handpicked it just for you. Hand, oh, Foley picked this up? Mm-hmm. Oh, this ought to be good, Joel. <laughs> is there, can, as I'm opening, is, is there another audience question? I'm sorry, I like the... Uh... Yeah, absolutely. Uh, another audience question is... Let's see, what is your favorite restaurant in Fayetteville? Oh, now that you're here. Oh, my goodness. Is the, is the AQ Chicken House still open or not? Okay, y'all tell me that's closed, closed. now. Um, what Doe's, I couldn't afford to go to Doe's Very um, expensive. when I was here. Um, but I could take all y'all tonight if y'all were here. <laughs> I told y'all this business pays as well. <laughs> um, uh, yeah, what else? What did I eat up there, Tish? Ham and trees and is really back, unique to Fayetteville. It's what, like yeah? that one. Ham and trees, it's that grilled cheese no, sandwich No, no, that wasn't my spot. <laughs> what's the, uh, what's the, what is it? Oh, I love some Hugos. They, they still do, they used to have like quarter beer nights or something. Yeah. They still something they used to do. All right, let me see here. Oh, good Lord, Jesus. <laughs> Is this the original? You got it. Is it really? <laughs> all right, let me tell you all this. He, he talked about his, um, the Mustang. All right, the convertible Mustang. It was red, right? All right, and I, when I was in school here, he was too old for that car then, right? So. <laughs> It was the most ridiculous thing you've ever seen in your life. And he thought he was cool as a fan, right? Cool, khakis with the pleats, right? And he was just in it chilling. He was cool. But it had UATV on it. What's his license plate? Uh, Don't you all? Oh, that's not sweet. It's ridiculous. It's ridiculous. Where are you going to put it? His wife is probably telling him to get rid of this damn thing for years. <laughs> Now they got an excuse. I'll make it a gift. Won't even, won't even cost the department anything. That is absurd. Say what? Oh my goodness. But yes, this was Foley back in the day. But really, guys, this was that department and this university put me on the path to where I am. And people always, I talk about Arkansas on the air a lot. Anytime I see somebody from Arkansas that comes to visit GMA that's outside with a sign, grab them and bring them in or go take a picture with them. I was wearing Razorback cufflinks the other day, not to get them on the air, but just because I was getting dressed that morning, Arkansas was playing, and I just put them on. Um, but this university, I'm so proud to be from Arkansas. I'm proud of where I am and where I'm from. I'm proud of the state, right? And we, I hope that comes off. I'm not doing it to, right? Like, I'm so proud of, hey, yeah, I'm from Arkansas. We, we're doing great in SEC football this year. Yay! Right? Well, that's not something to brag about sometimes. Yeah, what did Coach Bielema say? Oh, yeah, it's Arkansas, right? And I got so much crap about the stuff Brett Bielema I'm said. Um, but it's just, it's my school, and this is everything, and I am where I am because of the University of Arkansas, so it's, it's really. And as you can tell, I, we're very proud of you, too. Well, and we're very happy that you came tonight. Well, no, thank you guys. And again, I can't thank the Johnsons enough. I am here, and you all are here, and everything, because they thought enough of me to uh, bestow this honor upon me, and they've been great in town. They, they got me ripping and running, and got Sabine and I jumping in and out of golf carts, and, <laughs> and meeting folks, and shaking hands, and busy all day, but this is just when your university invites you back, right? I'm not just here and came for a game and said hi. 
I was actually invited back because my university wants to claim me. That's a, uh, that's a big deal. That's a big deal. Well, DJ, it was a pleasure talking oh, no, to no, you. Oh, no, thank you, Dr. Bustamante, as they say, right? That is, I don't have that. Okay. No. <laughs> Definitely so <still> student. <laughs> All right, well, thank you again, and I hope that you enjoy the rest of your time. Of course I will. Of course I will. Can I get a chain and hang this around my... <laughs> <laughs> See? All right, guys, let's give one more round of applause for TJ. Journalism and Strategic, sorry about that, Media. It's all I have to say. Thanks, guys. That was when I decided not only am I serious about working in the newspaper business, but I want to work for a Metropolitan Daily. I'm a Lemke alum, an Arkansas native, and a Razorback through and through. So what I'm about to say comes from the heart. We didn't deserve Roy Reed. He was a gift. His wife, Norma, please recognize Norma Reed. <laughs> Norma agreed to move to Hog Eye, Arkansas. Now, Roy was an excellent reporter, absolutely beautiful writer. Gene Roberts, who was Roy's national editor at the New York Times, called Roy a writing fool. And he said that with profound admiration. Roy's reporting at home and abroad put readers in right there at the scene. His reporting on the civil rights movement put readers in the middle of notable events, on the Edmund Pettus Bridge, on the road to Jackson, Mississippi, or to uh, Oxford, Mississippi. So it's fitting that on this occasion, we honored one of the reporters who chronicled the civil rights movement, and we honor the fallen hero who was assassinated in Memphis. At 6.01 this evening, the Toller Bell sounded 39 times to mark the assassination of Dr. Martin Luther King 50 years ago. Can't believe it's been that long. Roy certainly would have appreciated that recognition. When he retired, the Roy Reed Lecture Series was established to honor him and to keep his memory. We're indeed fortunate that he chose the University of Arkansas. See, Roy was a Missouri graduate. And had he sought prestige and fanfare, he could have taught at the oldest journalism school in the country. Roy didn't grow up in the Ozarks. He was from Hot Springs. But he chose the mountains, and thank God he chose the U of A. We're so lucky that on the occasion of his retirement, then chair, 
Dr. Patsy Watkins led the effort to establish this Roy Reed Lecture. Over the years, Pulitzer Prize winners and a bevy of some of the finest journalists in the country have come here to speak, to meet our students, and to honor Roy, and now honor Roy's memory. So we have to honor him by continuing that tradition in perpetuity. Roy was my golfing buddy, and we'd sit in the cart and talk about the Roy Reed lecture, and he'd say, oh, well, it's about played out. I said, no way, man, absolutely not. No, it hasn't played out. So I'd ask him, who do you want to be the Roy Reed lecturer? All you decide. No, it's in your name. If it left up to me, it'd be one of the Marx brothers. <laughs> Roy said he wanted damn good journalists to come here and speak to the students. And I think we're upholding that tradition. I hope that in years to come, we'll continue to honor Roy in that way. He was one of the building blocks of what is now the journalism school. So tonight, on the occasion of the Roy Reed Lecture, we pause to remember one of the great ones in journalism. And there are others here tonight, the current faculty, everybody wave if you're on the journalism faculty. They don't even know how to wave. <laughs> and at least two emeritus professors Professor Hoyt Purvis, please stand up, Hoyt. And Professor <laughs> Patsy Watkins. Now, Hoyt, I want you to know that we're working on creating an appropriate honor for you. I have been lobbying for Hoyt Hall over at the Kemple, room 102. That should be Hoyt Hall. And we're going to do that even if I have to slip in there one night late and just hang the sign over the door myself. <laughs> So tonight with the Reed Lecture, the tradition continues, and I hope sincerely, young people, you can say, I was here 30 or 40 years ago and that doddering old fool got up there and started talking about somebody I'd never heard of. But read his books, read the clips, and you'll know Roy Reed. So I hope the, the tradition continues until well after we're all ashes in the grave. Thank you so much. I started in 1995 when Lutilius walked the halls. I was always dazzled by this young man who would take a few steps away from the water fountain and young women would just swoon. <laughs> Hi, Lieutenant. It was embarrassing. If you'll come up, we have something for you, TJ. This is a commemorative for Roy Reed speakers, lecturers. It says, University of Arkansas, School of Journalism and Strategic Media, presented to TJ Holmes, on the occasion of the Roy Reed Lecture, April 4th, 2018. Thank you. I I, wh where do y'all get these stories? Y'all just make this stuff up over the years. I saw it. You can stop. Just I, stop. I, these, I saw it. Walking down the hall. The water fountain? Hi, the water fountain? <laughs> the one that's right out the door. Oh, you know the water fountain. <laughs> <laughs> it was a lasting memory. Thank you. Thank you, my brother. There's only one last thing that I want to say. Yes, we are proud of T.J. Holmes. It's a long way from West Memphis to CNN and ABC's Good Morning America. But T.J. knows this because I like to mess with him. It doesn't mean that I don't love him because I do. But this I want to leave you with. Yes, we're proud of his career, 
but I am personally prouder of the man you've become than anything you've done in your career. Thank you guys for coming out tonight.